Welcome, everybody, to Blood and Bone. The Blood and Bone podcast is a Transcendent Truth Media podcast. If you'd like any more information about that, what we're doing there, you can go to transcendenttruthmedia.com. Um, of course, there's the three W's that precede that. Um, and then uh, you can find all of our other podcasts. You can find some blog articles. You can find our merch store. You, know, you can pick up one of these beautiful hoodies. I believe Pastor Roland has his, has his mug there. There we go. We're all set and good to go. Today, we have a special guest on. Uh, Athanasius, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, Dr. Athanasius, as you said very well, I am one of the hosts of yours truly, the Wittenberg Project channel. Uh, we have been up and doing a number of series of uh, a series of videos. Now we have close to 100 videos touching on different uh, Lutheran topics from the perspective of myself, uh, Black. Afro-Latino individual uh, living now in America. And then, of course, my good friend Lex, who has been a Lutheran for longer than I am. So we both of both of us, we teamed up to make this very special uh, channel to reach minorities. And in my case, I'm doing a separate channel called Proyecto Wither, in which uh, it's, it's all in Spanish, of course. I'm trying to reach out to different theologians uh, and lead people and, and try to interview them. I bring a different perspective into the, let's say, the normal or the uh, what people mostly relate with Lutheranism, which is the fact that, you know, Lutherans have a, a tradition that is Catholic. It's universal. We have many branches out there. In fact, uh, I don't know if you know this, my brother, but the average uh, Lutheran person in the world is is a female, is black, and is 19 years old. So the average Lutheran in the world is a woman that is black and is 19 years old. We truly have a Catholic, very international tradition, starting from the beginning. It was one of the main topics that we uh, we spoke about with our good friend Flame. I don't know if you saw that video. I would encourage you yep. to all of you guys to see it, in which we spoke about uh, the connections that we have to Africa and to Orthodoxy and how Father Luther was trying to bring all of these things uh, to the front, to the fray. Uh, and so, yes, that's what we do. Um, I'm very pleased to be with you guys, and I think we're going to have some fun tonight. Yeah. So tonight we're talking a little bit about theosis, the doctrine of deification. And uh, could we, yes. perhaps we could begin by you, Dr. Athanasius, giving us a, a little bit of some information on why you wanted to talk about theosis and why this was on your mind. That's a great. That's a great question. The, the, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is you know, theosis is just a cool sounding word. So you know, you, it's is one of those words that I mean, like I just it's just a, a word that kind of piqued my curiosity. Um, I, I have heard uh, many prominent Lutherans, uh, theologians, speak about it, but for some reason, I feel like uh, a little disconnected. Like I don't fully understand the topic, or it, it hasn't been explained to the point where I as a layman, and I would suspect other, uh, you know, you know, average Lutherans that are just going about life, not necessarily theologians, that we would, we, we haven't had a chance to speak as far as to like a simple definition of what the word is, uh, the, you know, the, the benefits and maybe the problems. I, I think you're going to illustrate us a little bit more further down the line as far as some problems that the, the the teaching has or whatnot. So it's it's just a matter of curiosity, trying to understand uh, a, a teaching that seems to be biblical for some traditions. Uh, it seems to be an older teaching. So I, and of course it piques my curiosity. I want to know what this is all about. If it's really that complicated, if it's dangerous, if it's if it's, if it's something that I should incorporate into my daily life. So those those are the things that my curiosity and I wanted to know more about more about the topic yeah yeah as as the listener probably knows if they've dug around in the kind of the social media world of um, yes. not just Lutheranism but all the theology that this topic is spoken about and even if it's not explicitly spoken about as theosis these concepts are and this kind of um especially as Pastor Roland's going to explain to us in a little bit how this concept of um, Platonism and progress and, and ladder theology, right, a movement and a progress from going from what we are to something that we, you know, ought to be, um, 
colors, mm -hmm. not just Eastern Orthodox theology, but also Roman Catholic theology, and not just that, which we consider as Protestants, you know, the, the works theology, but it also characterizes mm -hmm. so much of Protestant theology, and so many people's consciences are burdened day and night by pastors, preachers, teachers, and just the average believer who tells them that what they are is not what they should be, and that's true, but then they're going to tell them that mm. ought, can, ought implies can, and that they need to be pulling themselves up by their bootstraps and going on this progress. But before we get to that, Pastor Roland, oh, yeah. would, you, would you care to give us a little bit of an introduction on how we, how we got to this place in Christianity? Yeah, well... A couple of years ago, for one of my seminary classes, I actually did a very in-depth study of this topic, and I looked really into the philosophy that kind of was the bed from which the doctrine of theosis was built. And the first thing that we really need to understand about theosis is it is thoroughly platonic, and I mean like thoroughly platonic. So basically, especially in Neoplatonism, you have this idea of the one, the sort of supreme being. And out of the one are these emanations. And there's the noose, there's the psyche, there's all these sort of emanations. And anyway, once you get to where the place where humans occupy, there's your several layers removed from the one. And essentially the goal in Neoplatonic thought is to make your way back up in a very ladder like mm. way back to the one. And so a lot of Christian, early Christian thinkers, especially the Cappadocian fathers, Gregory, Gregory, and um, oh, heavens, what's the other one? Can't think of, can't think of the other name right now, but two Gregories. And then um, I'll think of it in a minute. I don't categorize my patristics by geography. I'm sorry, Pastor Roland. Sure, no, that's fine. Uh, that's fine. I'll think of it in a minute. But long story short, the Cappadocian fathers basically looked at that Neoplatonic idea. Of course, they were trained very much in the Platonic school, as a lot of Greek thinkers were, a lot of theologians of the time were. And they looked at it and they said, hey, you know, that's a great idea. And we're going to Christianize that. And so basically they did. And so the idea became that one could be uh, so sort of bound to Christ, so full of Christ, that one could essentially uh, take part in that process of going back to the one. And that is sort of the idea of, the, the, of theosis, the idea that you're being emptied out of what is lower, of what is lesser, of what is... Uh, worldly, and you're being filled with the sort of mediator of the one who, of course, we would identify as Christ. And of course, the Cappadocians and the doctrine of theosis would identify as Christ. And, yeah. Could I interject there, Pastor Roland? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I just want to, um, <clears throat> I guess, tune the listener into um, some of the context of what these patristics were doing, what these church fathers were doing. It seems frankly stupid to us so many years removed and we are like why would you do that that's ridiculous but in their context greek philosophy was the standard way of thinking right mm -hmm. and it was like it was the world view of the west of the time right and so this is how you thought about everything it's not just some random idea that they were picking out of the bunch as we would see it today but at the time it was the it was the world view every single person shared and they you can you can imagine how they would see these things fitting together where pastor roland was talking about how you had the noose and you had the uh whatever it was i swear i passed philosophy course guys i swear but you have the other thing and then you, you have what you are and you're removed from what you should be and you need to get yourself back up there so for the church fathers steeped in that worldview when they go and read a text like the, the, the narrative of the creation, the fall, and then of the proto-evangelion, right, of, of, the, of the first gospel and then the redemption that follows through, they're like, oh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I know what that is, right? That's, that's Plato, right? Because they're thinking mm -hmm. of we were what we are, should be, then we fell to what we are now, and now we are being redeemed and brought closer to what we ought to be. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and that's exactly right. And I think that is important to highlight the fact it's not, 
there's it's very weird the time we live in because there's this a lot of sort of anti-intellectual fundamentalist movements that say, ooh, philosophy, don't want to touch that with a 30-foot pole. And yet they'll turn around and confess the Apostles' Creed. They'll confess the Trinitarian doctrines, all of which, sorry, folks, are <laughs> deeply steeped in Greek philosophy. Yeah. And this is why I begin, actually, my paper on this topic in the way, in the following way. I, I quote uh, a scholar, um, what's his name? Uh, I quote John Lenz, who says Christianity is in crucial ways a highly philosophical religion, and it was written first in ancient Greek. Mm. There, there's no way around that. And here is an excellent case of that. And really, at the end of the day, what these uh, church fathers were trying to do was trying to find a way to describe what is it exactly the journey mm -hmm. that the Christian goes on. And they saw it in mm. the old and they said, this is exactly what we're we're thinking about this is exactly what happens and so the synthesis to people like the cappadocians and now i finally remember the name basil gregory and gregory this made perfect sense okay it was a marriage made in heaven essentially i knew it was i knew it was basil i just didn't want to guess and be wrong mm -hmm. <laughs> i do want to ask uh, something pastor roland uh that caught my attention For the first first i want to make a comment that you know, I I don't think it's very good for any of us to be too critical or condemn uh, people from you know that came before us uh, thousands of years ago. Because I think I think it was C.S. Lewis that said that 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 is uh, he he coined the term chrono chronological snobbery, mm -hmm. where we think that we are so much better than than the others. Uh, but you know, the fact of the matter is we are all, let's say, uh, infected by the age that we live in. And so the same way, and I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong, but the same way that uh, people 2,000 years ago were affected, the theology was affected by neoplatonic tendencies or whatnot, we are also affected by the culture that surrounds us. Some of us are extremely materialistic or individualistic or whatever, and that seeps into our Theology, just just a side of few uh, elements that we that surround us, you know, the, the the crazy individualism or whatever whatever thing is surrounding us, and we don't we don't have the capacity to analyze or to to filter out those things that do not belong to Christianity. But to Christianity, but I, I wanted to. So you made the comment, uh, Pastor Rowan, <clears throat> that even the creeds are uh, let's say affected or infected by uh, Neoplatonic views, or or, or, or deeply uh, philosophical things. Uh, it, it, did I hear you correctly? And if so, uh, can you explain that a little bit? You know, you know for for a few minutes. But I'm, I'm curious. That just piqued my curiosity. I've never I have never heard of that before. Yeah. So basically, uh, I would like to clarify a few things. I 100% agree with you, Dr. Athanasius, about the fact that we can't look back on other times and say, oh, man, I'm so much smarter than these folks. You know, these I mean, at the end of the day, I have nothing but the deepest respect for the Cappadocian fathers. They have contributed more yeah. to the church than I, <laughs> I ever will. I can tell you that much. And uh, I, I would also like to clarify that although I recognize that these church fathers are often swimming in the milieu of Neoplatonic and Platonic thought, I don't actually see that as a negative thing because I'm very much oh, okay. of the opinion that philosophy is the handmaiden of theology. I'm, I'm very much in that sort of a camp where I see, a, I see a very comfortable marriage between the two. And so when I'm saying that these are Neoplatonic inspired, Neoplatonically inspired, that isn't necessarily a critique that's just an observation more than anything. But I do appreciate the question and your comment okay. to, for me to kind of further clarify my position on that matter. Uh, that being said, obviously, we do believe that uh, theosis is, is an incorrect doctrine because it becomes a sort of a ladder, even if it's intended not to. But regardless, uh, yeah, my problem with it isn't that it's a syncretism with philosophy. My problem is it's Mm -hmm. I, I believe it to be incorrect when when one looks at scripture and especially when one understands the doctrine of justification, oh, yeah. especially as the confessions do. Uh, does does that clarify uh, that point, doctor? It, it, it does. It does. I appreciate. I mean, I was not trying to be. 
I just I was just trying to because um, I think that sometimes we have a, a negative view of what philosophy is, but I think mm -hmm. you clarified it well. It's a you know handmade of theology and and so it has its place. Uh, yeah, it, it was double, double model. Thank you so much for, for that clarification. Of course, I already have some more questions in my mind, but I think uh, as we progress in our conversation, there's going to be the place to ask those questions, you know? Yeah, and and okay. if, if I may, I'll just quickly address the second point. A lot of our creedal statements, of course, in their original Greek, particularly if you look at the Nicene Creed, a lot of it uses terms that were deeply, deeply steeped in Neoplatonic thought, homoousion. Um, those are all sorts of um, sort of very, very <coughs> philosophically inspired um, terms. And furthermore, if you look at the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, especially as it's worked out by the Cappadocian fathers, well, the Cappadocian fathers were Neoplatonists through and through. And so a lot of their sort of Trinitarian theology is very much an attempt to synthesize um, a lot of Neoplatonic doctrine with, okay, well, how do we, how do we understand that God is, is three, but also one? And a lot of the ways in which they try to explain that is through a Neoplatonic framework. And I, interestingly enough, the Cappadocian work on that matter ended up having a massive influence as on later councils and really wormed its way into uh, sort of what we would now call orthodox Trinitarian doctrine. And so that's kind of the comment that I make there. Um, so, so yeah, I think, I think it's just important for us to realize um, we can't be like the fundamentalists that say, well, I'm just going to open my Bible and God's going to reveal everything to me. You know, we are the inheritors of a marriage between philosophy and theology over the years. And I, I guess it's just all I'm saying is we need to recognize that. Of course. Yeah. Of course. If I could add a little my, bit. My, 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 my rule of thumb is that whenever I hear someone saying that, you know, the Bible is my only creed or the, the, the only thing that I need is the Bible, as soon as I hear that, I know that this individual is going to start <laughs> just a cascade of philosophical. <laughs> he has a creed that he has even recognized, or he or she. But, but no, nobody comes comes to the Bible with that open slate, like without any influences. All of us have philosophies that are undercurrents to our theological beliefs. That's just unescapable. It's just it's just a matter of you to recognizing and realizing that you have these things in mind. So yeah. I fully agree with what you're saying. We cannot we cannot go back to fundamentalism. We we have to realize that there is philosophy married to theology and whatnot. So there you go. Yeah, just wanted to say that. Yeah. <laughs> and if I could add upon that and kind of riff on some of those ideas to help bridge this conversation closer to the theosis, is that um, I really mm -hmm. liked what you said, Pastor Roland, and it's actually something that I've taught on and said several times, um, which are on my Bible studies and sermons and everywhere else is that the, and this is together with the fact that for these people, Plato and Aristotle was the worldview. That was the worldview. And um, so when they're articulating the creed, um, a, lot of, a lot of our parishioners, a lot of laity will read the creed, not understand what's being said because they don't, we, that's not a common worldview anymore, right? We, we have transitioned as a whole globe into a broader span of theological understanding and differences in, in, in sorry, philosoph philosophical understanding. And so many different philosophies have arisen out of that. And um, one thing that's really important is that we recognize that the reason that it's written in Platonism, in our, you know, Arist Aristotelian categories is not because God liked those best. It's because those were what was there in the context. So as Pastor Roland said, they were trying to articulate these divine truths in the way that they know they knew how to a people who shared this one worldview. To, uh, this is the same reason that it's written in Greek, right? We say, why were, why were the creeds written in Greek philosophy? Same reason they were written in Greek, right? It's not rocket science, exactly, right? And so the way that we um, understand these things will change and it will shift, and that doesn't mean throw the creed. That doesn't mean rewrite the creed under every different philosophical um, perspective that can be had. But what it does mean is that the, the, the place of philosophy has always been connected with theology, but philosophy has not remained static. 
And one thing that I really like was said by a reformed guy was, uh, I think it was Charles Hodge on in his prolegomena. And he was talking about like revelation and how we understand these things. And he said, well, if the arbiter of divine truth is philosophy, then divine truth is going to have to be constantly changing. Right. But we know that it's not. Rather, our worldviews are, our languages are, and our experiences are. And that brings us back to, I suppose, theosis. Because one of the weird things is that our worldview as Western society, and I don't know what they're doing over in China or Japan or whatever, but over here in the West, um, most people are different forms of materialists or empiricists or they're existentialists, God bless them, um, <laughs> is, is, the, is the, the fact of the matter is that most churches are still using Platonism or Aristotelianism. Most of them are, right? So whether we look at um, Eastern Orthodox theosis or whether we look at the Roman Catholic understanding of a participatory justification and, and an imparted grace which allows you to then merit your salvation, or if we look at the evangelical, right, the American evangelical Protestant understanding of salvation, or sorry, rather specifically sanctification, which is as this, like a latter theology, it's the Platonism all over again. There's something really interesting about what has happened there with the conservative church and trying to not only conserve the theology, but the philosophy along with it in like exact form. And I think that's really what has caused this theosis debate is that there are people who are arguing that Plato is not divinely inspired. That's really what this comes down to, because there's nothing. I mean, it's argued that there are some things in the text, and I think we'll talk about them today, such as you are partakers of divine, uh, partakers of the divine nature, right? But uh, I think we're going to we're going to get there eventually. So that, that I think that gives us a good foundation to work with as to how we got theosis. It's really a pulling of Plato and Aristotle into um, the divine revelation and the gospel. And it's saying, yeah, you're going to be saved by God's grace. But this has to be by this kind of progressive transformation of the individual. Right. So it, it wasn't even conceived by most people that you could be named righteous and righteous for the sake that you were named it by God. That didn't occur to most people. The, the one thing I would add to, to this, and I think this is an important quote just to further contextualize how deeply embedded this is in Plato, is John Lenz, once again, who I quoted earlier, summarizes Plato's mindset in the following way. And he says, all human beings possess an innate divinity which we should seek to free from the body by our own efforts. Normally, the soul is tainted by contact with the body, expressed by the slogan, Soma Sema, the body is a tomb of the soul. Being immortal, it enters into successive incarnations. Only the philosopher, the perfect sage, will achieve the ultimate escape from the cycle of the soul's continual rebirth and reincarnation. So we see very clearly here not just the influence for a lot of Eastern thought or sort of many of the same things that we find in Eastern religion, but we also find here an incredible insight into where this doctrine of theosis comes, but not even just this doctrine of theosis, but this whole, whole idea of a ladder theology, this whole idea of, of working towards actualization. And it, it all, it's all Plato, it's Plato all the way down. <laughs> And that's really what it is, is it really is a ladder theology, whether we look at it in the Eastern Orthodox frame of mind or really, I mean, what we're, we're all Lutherans here, right? So I think what's most on our minds is how this has been encroaching upon Lutheranism, because uh, we look at what happened in the Eastern Orthodox understanding of it. We're like, well, that's obviously wrong. And then we look at what the Roman Catholics have done with their understanding of a participatory justification. We say, well, that's obvious long, obviously wrong. But then it starts to get a little bit Protestant, doesn't it? And, and that that's what brings yes. the, the problems. And that's what brings the um, confusion, because we have several different things going on. For, for one, we have a way of talking about um, sanctification in two ways really maybe even three ways of talking about sanctification and protestantism two of them are in the book of Concord, right? so one of them is we see the the luther's catechisms small and large 
right? What is mm-hmm. sanctification in the catechisms? It has nothing to do with our participatory progress. It has to do with the Holy Spirit's monergistic work of bringing us into the church, giving us the means of grace, forgiving our sin, and then it skips right to our death, and it says the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, right? And if you go into the larger catechism where this is expanded, the part that's expanded is the means of grace part. It's not the um, what happens from the forgiveness of sins until the end. Whereas you look at most other Protestants and you say sanctification, and what do what do they immediately start to think about? Are they the things that I can do? Things I can do exactly. Yeah. yeah. How am I, how am I progressing and whatnot? You know. Yeah, and that's why it that's why it's so on the the conscience and the minds of the people of the church is because this, when it has come into Protestantism, it has named specifically the thing that you do every single day. And it has come with the nasty habit of also coming along with the threat and the warning of the law coming in through the back door that says, yeah, you may be justified by faith alone, but if you are justified by faith alone, then your life every day will look like this. Right. And then where are people looking for their assurance of salvation? Where are they looking for their hope and their peace and their comfort? Right. To themselves. Their works. Their works. Exactly. So is, that's is that, is, is that, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm uh, interjecting here a little bit. Um, at the beginning, when you were making the introduction, uh, Connor, about um, how theosis is not a situation that happened way back yonder, but there, there is a, there's a type of theosis happening in our which is not called by that name. Mm-hmm. Is that what you're referring to when, when you say that even today we're looking at, like, I don't know, there are other traditions or just even Lutherans perhaps may fall into that trap or whatever. <clears throat> they may look, they may have a certain type of theosis happening in their lives as we speak, but they're not calling it that way. Is that what we're getting at here? Yeah, that's exactly. Uh, for you too. That's that's exactly what I'm trying to get at. Is that you see, and to name just a few of them, we have written even, for example, the formula of Concord seeks to speak of sanctification in a different way than do the catechisms, and it actually acknowledges this, and it says thus for, thus far, including not only the catechisms but the small called articles, the treatise, and the um, the the Augsburg Confession and the Apology there too, is that it says up until now, sanctification has been spoken about in this way, referring to the way it's used in the catechisms, broadly, salvation. But then they say, now we're going to speak of it in this way. And what they're speaking of in referring in, in reference to is the way that the non-Lutheran Protestants understand it, which is as this kind of process of getting from you're, you're really sinful to a little less sinful, right? And yeah. um that's one thing that's happening. That's in the formula of Concord. Then a little bit later, we've got, I mean, obviously I already named the other Protestants and how they understand sanctification, but within Lutheranism, then as a dialogue between the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Finnish Lutheran State Church was uh, Tuomo Manorma came out with what's called the New Finnish Interpretation. Uh, we, we say it was him, but of course it was him in dialogue with the Eastern Orthodox Church, and a lot of scholars were involved in this. But he was heading up this mm-hmm. project, and basically what he wanted to do was he wanted to take um, this idea of theosis and acknowledge that in, in, many, in many ways and shapes and forms, he said, um, our justification is not merely imputed. And the way that he's going to understand these terms are not the way that we will necessarily, but essentially what he's trying to get at is he's trying to say, the reason that we are justified is because Christ is legitimately in us, just as he became sin for us. Now he lives in us, Galatians 2.20, right? And so when God Mm -hmm. looks at us, he doesn't just see us as if Christ were in us, but he sees Christ in us because he's truly there. Now the hang up though, I'll add this, the hang up that so many people had with Manorma was that they were inserting within his work something he never said, which was that he was therefore assenting to and agreeing with the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholics that because Christ dwelled in him, that means he's less of a sinner himself. He did not say that, right? That's not in his works. Um, that's something that we would have to assume he's dead now, so we can't really ask him. But I would say there's a great book 
that's edited by Carl Broughton and Robert W. Jensen called, uh, I think it's just called The Finnish New Interpretation, Union with Christ, something, something. It's a multi-author book. And uh, what I really like about that book is that it takes some of the more philosophical things in Manor Ma and it kind of pulls it back. And what it's, what it's trying to leave there is really just focusing on this idea that union with Christ, which is how Manor Ma was understanding theosis, not as progress, right? Not as ladder, because that's, that's what I'm saying is the problem with theosis. But union with Christ and Christ's presence in you and your presence in him, that is where justification is. So he's saying it's not merely nominal, and don't, don't think about nominalism here, but he's saying it's not just something that is named as the case, but something that actually is the case because it was named and it's named because it is the case. Right. And we see a lot of this language actually in the apology of the Augsburg Confession, where Melanchthon is saying you were named righteous and you are righteous. You're counted righteous and you are made righteous. And the two statements coincide perfectly. They go hand in hand and one cannot be interpreted without the other also. Um, so basically what Manorma said was he disagreed with the formula of Concord because what the formula of Concord was saying with this narrow way of speaking about just sanctification was it was saying union with Christ happens after uh, justification and salvation. And it's just this thing that doesn't affect our salvation, but it's just about you becoming good as a side product or a byproduct rather. Right. So Manorma was saying, no, um, that might be true, like insofar as what they mean, but union with Christ itself is actually the cause of justification, or he's not necessarily saying it has to precede, but he's saying it could either precede justification or could coincide with it, like as a one in the same thing. Um, so that's, that's like the main thing that we're talking about within theosis in Lutheranism, but online... As we know, things online, on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, don't actually look like what they look like in the academic world. <laughs> and so if you go online and you talk about theosis in Lutheranism, people are only really just talking about Jordan Cooper. And the tricky thing about that is that what Jordan Cooper did, I hope he's not watching this because I'm not sure he likes me or my professor or most of the things I do, but... <laughs> <laughs> is um is he he was essentially trying to bridge manorma he admitted to this by the way so i'm not putting anything in his mouth he admitted to trying to bridge manorma and the formula of concord and he said that they don't have to be mutually exclusive now what he's doing there you'll see is that they're both talking about union with christ this is where it gets dangerous the formula of concord says it has to um is the word secede or no proceed it has to come after justification and salvation because they're talking about good doing more good doing less sin and becoming what you are not now manorma said it either precedes or coincides with and it has nothing to do with in itself works, it, though it causes works, right? Big difference there. Mm -hmm. Now, Cooper is trying to bring them together. That is what I would say is the real danger. I would not say Manor Ma is the real danger, whether we agree with him or not. I would not say the formula of Concord divines are the real danger, whether we agree with them or not. But I would say that the real danger is when we try to mix, again, as it always is, right? When we try to mix... Um, justification or salvation and good works mm, interesting yeah does dr roland have anything to add well the only thing that i would say is i mean it's important to get all these contextualizations because this is an extraordinarily complicated issue mm. and oftentimes it doesn't get treated with the nuance that it deserves or that it needs and the biggest reason is because quite frankly it's extremely complicated uh, it's hard to nuance some of these positions. So yeah, the average video that you'd watch online about theosis, the average article you'd read, it, it's it's very surface level and it lacks a lot of the contextualization. And I would just reiterate what, what Connor is saying. I think it's very important that when we're having a conversation about theosis, you, you could understand theosis as something that maybe happens after justification, but it can, you know, as a Lutheran, you cannot say that it precedes justification or that it's the result of justification. Like I said, I, th I think there is room for debate about what happens after a person is justified. You know, obviously scripture bears witness to this idea that, 
you know, we're, our minds are being reformed, we're, we're being transformed. Okay, that's great. So there's debate that can be had as to what that all means and what it all looks like. But to say that that theosis precedes justification is very much a ladder theology and is very much um, really falls into the error, I think, of, of sort of a, a works righteousness. I mean, just listen to what Gregory, um, one of the Gregory says about theosis. He says this, um, whoever has been permitted to escape from matter and from the fleshly cloud, or should we call it a veil, by means of reason and contemplation, so as to hold communion with God and be associated with the purest light, insofar as human nature can attain it, such a man is truly blessed, both in terms of his ascent from here and in terms of his deification there, a deification which is conferred by true philosophy and by the virtue of his rising above all the duality of matter through that unity which is perceived in the Trinity. So, so this is this is like a whole ontological change here that we're talking about. This is this is about yeah. becoming something entirely new and in a very different way than what our confessions would say comes the newness of Christ and say like baptism, a very different ontological shift here. Yeah, and and what's important within this kind of dis tension here is that when we, when we look at man or ma, for example, we need to recognize and realize that where he was locating, like the getting of and the substance of um, union with Christ was the means of grace. Was the word preached? Was the supper eaten and, and, and drunk? And was baptism received? It was not his works, right? Now, if we move over to the formula of Concord, they did teach, in fact, that the substance of how you get this union with Christ is your good works. Now, there is a very simple, in my opinion, my humble opinion, way to synthesize and to fix this and to resolve it. If you want to affirm that justification is affected by union with Christ, that's fine. Just keep works out of it, right? That you have union with Christ in his flesh, by virtue of his incarnation, that you have union with Christ by virtue of baptism, Romans 6, 4, that you have union with Christ by virtue of you eating of his flesh and drinking his blood, that you have union with Christ by your faith in him and you're partaking of uh, the divine nature in that way, right? Um, now, if you want to say that that will give you affections, affections to do good works, to sin less, fine. There you go. You've synthesized now <laughs> man or ma in the formula of Concord, and you've kept latter theology out of it. Now, I would still prefer to say that what is said in the formula of Concord, um, in my opinion, and this is as, of course, this is a little bit biased because, um, as our listeners will know, Roland and I um, are in Calc, and Calc does not bind us to um, confess the formula of Concord, and there are lots of other churches which do not confess it. I love the formula of Concord, mind you. I just think that if we're going to say this to individuals who are laymen, we need to be really, really, really careful, because if you say anything about sanctification being your sinning less, doing more good, that is all they will hear and take away from you. They won't hear anything about justification. They won't hear any, they won't even hear anything about the law that they should do, right? Because all they're thinking about, they've been placed back under the yoke of slavery. They want to have a good relationship with God. You've told them how to do that, but now they can't think about anything else other than the fact that they aren't doing it, right? And, and they're not going Correct. to because the law always accuses. Okay. So let me let me see if I understand uh, if, if I'm understanding this correctly. Maybe maybe this is an opportunity for me to be uh, further illustrated. So the whole issue with uh, or the danger with theosis is a uh, confusion between uh, justification and sanctification. Am I am I correctly? One one thing that crossing. I would. One thing that I would say is, I mean, that's definitely been articulated, but I think an even better, sharper way of saying this is that it's it's a confusing of the way that we get salvation, either in sanctification or justification. So theosis is saying that it is participatory 
I am saying mm -hmm. I'm a bag of dead bones and life has come outside of me and it has come to me. Right. That is the big difference. Okay. It's about the performative it. word, really. Yeah. It's, it's, I, like Connor said, I was dead. God spoke life into me through forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And, and so there's a sense that that's, that's really what the difference becomes. And I, I think highlighting that difference is very important. And, and I'm glad Connor really explained the importance of this, especially when you're talking with laity, because the last thing you want to do is give them the idea that, okay, you're justified. Now what? Okay, you know, time to time to get all these works done. You know, you you know, you've you've you're in the club, but you really want to get higher into the club, and then it becomes this sort of weird hierarchy. And you see this uh, ironically among a lot of evangelicals, where you'll get the, oh, yeah. this sort of idea, well, oh, this person is so much holier than I am. Well, it's like not really because Christ justified you, Christ justified them, so you're both justified in Christ. So how can one speak of you know, greater or lesser degrees of holiness when the ultimate thing that justifies us is the atoning death of Christ imputed to us through the performative word and received in the receptacle that is faith. Yeah, and... Um... I think it's, it's such a weird thing to say or to make the claim that you become more like God uh, by doing such and such works. That's kind of the... the it's, it's such a... Uh, to me, it's like I'm missing the whole the whole picture of what the gospel is all about. It's so kind of sad, to be honest with you. Yeah, and, and another thing that it really does, and and this is one of the the huge dangers, and why I said earlier that it 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 keeps us from actually hearing the law and really caring about it as it was given, and um, because one of the things that this does is it really points the crosshair, um, in regard to good works away from our neighbor. And so we're, we're, we're no longer doing them freely, voluntarily for the other, loving as we've been loved. But now we're doing it to please God, the third party. And so the neighbor becomes a means to the end. And we're not really even sure what the means to the, like what the end is. Is the end just God's pleasure or is the end our salvation? And it's really not clear. Because in a lot of churches, it comes off as this kind of scary do this or else theology. Yes. Yes. Well, this is this has been a great le learning experience. I, I really, uh, I'm really understanding wh why this is what it's all about and the dangers of it. It's yeah. Very good stuff. Yeah. One, so one, we we're still we, we're we're still living under uh, the danger of that kind of thing. That the, the issue is that many of us don't even understand it. But like on the other on the other side, you know, I want to hear your comment. On the other side, I can see how a lot of people can take this. And so, okay, we, we don't do works because we want to uh, please God or be justified uh, if, uh, in front of God or for God through our works. But, so, but we say as good Lutherans, the works that we do is because we love our neighbor. It's just, you know, we're just loving our neighbor. But um, there's always people out there that would say, well, look, if this person is truly justified and whatnot, uh, shouldn't you see like an improvement in his life or a change in his behavior, that kind of thing? To people like that, what would you say? Do you want to take a crack at this, Pastor Roland? Well, I, I think at the end of the day, this is where I would sort of... Um, this is where I would make an appeal to Bonhoeffer in the sense that like at the end of the day, how can we really discern what is, what is the fruit and what isn't necessarily at the end of the day, only God knows who's, who's, who's his own are and who they are. not And so at the end of the day, really it's, you put your faith in Christ and wait for God to judge you in a sense. And um, so I, Although, although there's a degree to which obviously the gospel transforms people, and obviously you do often see change in a person's life, the, the absence of change, I'm not comfortable saying is the absence of salvation, because that, that uh -huh. makes it once again too subjective. And so that would be my, my argument, because at the end of the day, uh, who's to say 
that um, this person is any less justified because they they haven't quit smoking or something or they haven't quit exactly. doing this. Because at the end of the day, this is the Lutheran doctrine the, the, of the simul justus et peccator. You know, if someone mm. smokes till the day they die, are they going to hell because, you know, they've never <laughs> kicked the habit? Well, I'll never kick my sin habit. Am I going to hell? I mean, that's that's the fact of the matter. Yeah, yeah I, I think the <clears throat> the real uh, thrust of the stake in the heart of this one, it, it really has to do with the, the the concept that when people ask this question, they're assuming that progress in the in the flesh implies faith, where obviously we Correct. know that it doesn't. Someone can be a complete drug addict, turn their lives around, right? They could be a murderer or whatever, become a Buddhist, and now look, Coromundo before other men, well, they're great. You know, they, they they don't even hurt animals or plants or uh, spiders. Wow, exactly. it's so virtuous, right? Well, that's great and exactly. all. They're, they totally are virtuous. But this is why the distinction between law and gospel is so necessary, because it also comes with it. Yes. The distinction between works and faith, right? And so I, I may be one of the worst people you will ever meet. You don't know. Well, could be true, <laughs> right? But... I trust in Christ for my salvation. And that's where, that's really where the substance of salvation is. It's in Christ, not in me. And so there may be a very virtuous Muslim or a very virtuous Buddhist living down the street, but it's not their virtue that will save them. Because as Paul says, all of our good works are rubbish. They're garbage. In fact, Luther goes so far as to say, rightly so, before God, they are sins. The reason that we call them good works, the reason why the book of Concord says they're good and pleasing to God is for the sake of our faith in Jesus Christ. And in these works, doing them freely, voluntarily, not by compulsion or threat or fear or for self-preservation or in order to get into heaven or for the third party, but because we do them freely. We are exercising our faith in and through them because we have our assurity and our comfort in the gospel, not in the work. That mm -hmm. pleases God. Amen. Yeah, I don't know if you I don't know if you guys would agree with me, but to me, at the end of the day, is look, okay, we can go by works because uh, some some individual may never be able to kick whatever destructive habit that they have in their lives. They may to the day they die, they may be cursing like a sailor or having a bad temper. I mean, you, you just look at uh, Saint Jerome, for example, one of my favorite characters in the uh, in patristics. I don't, I don't know if he's considered a father, but but he's a prominent figure within Christianity. The guy was not the most lovable person in the planet. Like he he he, he, he was he was very nasty, like a curmudgeon and and always angry. But none of us would their question uh if he was you know a, a safe individual or not at the end of the day to me it's okay do you go to church and confess your sins uh do you do you eat the body of christ i mean the objective things which is you know go to church confess i don't know what you guys think about that it's too simplistic or too uh, ethereal or, or no, too I, uh, I think or, it's or, i think you're absolutely right that the experience of the human being so obviously tells us that any form of justification by works has to be false whether it's front end right you do the works then you're justified or this thing that we're talking about which is really justification by works backwards where they say yeah you're justified by faith but if you don't have works then you're not justified by faith right they're the same thing and our human experience tells us that is not going to work because I am not fundamentally going to change. And it's always really these three things. I always like to call it the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but that's all it ever is with this kind of exactly by work stuff. Are you doing something like a sexual no no? Are you doing so, like a substance no no? Drinking, smoking, uh, um, doing uh, LSD or cocaine, or and then the rock and roll. Are you swearing? Are you watching Game of Thrones and partying too much? right like it's never no one ever says have you loved your have you loved god with your whole heart mind and soul today no one will ever ask you that. or 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 or, or, or something like <laughs> or too much. nobody nobody talks about that yeah, well, yeah. But, 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 but what do you think what do, what do you think about the last thing that i said though which is uh you know is this an 
coming to church and confessing their sins or, or uh, not, not neglecting the need of the brothers and sisters, uh, eating the blood of the body of Christ every Sunday. Would you consider that uh, too much of works or is that where, like, is that where we get real uh, kind of uh, the cleansing of our sins? Uh, you, we're eating the blood of Christ. We, there's forgiveness of sins there. Is is that is that what kind of ultimately uh, seals us as Christians that we are partaking of these elements that we were baptized that we eat the Lord's Supper, we go to church and we confess? Is that is that a proper view of it, or is, that, is, is it too worksy? Well, if if I may, I I don't think it's a matter of of works. I mean, you can certainly turn sacraments into works, as we see, quite frankly, in the Roman Catholic Church. But I, I think at the end of the day, if you have a proper understanding of the sacraments, and you come before, you come to your church, you receive the body and blood of Christ, you receive absolution, these are objective promises of the word, of the performative word that your faith can then cling to. Uh, that That's not necessarily a work. That is precisely what God has prescribed for us to do. And so by and large, it is a good indication that if a person is coming to, to church, they're coming to the house of God, they're receiving the sacrament, they're, they're partaking in absolution and receiving the very real forgiveness of their sins. I absolutely believe that's, a, that's usually a good indicator. Now, that being said, even Luther re recognized that within the church are non-believers as well and and god will separate the sheep from the goats but that being said uh i would say by and large someone who is active in the life of the church is doing what they should be doing what god has called them to do because the church is the dispensary for the means of grace yes yes totally in agreement yeah, it, it really is, especially, and I was just, um, when I was uh, recording um, my episode on Genesis 1 through 3, I was mentioning that uh, it's striking uh, when we go through Genesis, when we go through the Old Testament narratives, that election comes through in full force of its particularity. And this is striking to us for two, three reasons, really. Firstly, because it is always going to beg the question, or I guess suppose in a different way, tempt us to then justify God for his choosing the one over the other. Then it is always going Correct. to demand that we, through having tried to justify God falsely, will then try to justify ourselves, right? And so the thing of the matter is, if we're going to get it right, we can't do those two things. The only thing that we can do is recognize that righteousness comes from God's promise, right? You look at Noah, you look at David, you look at Abraham. These were all very horrible people. And yet they were called righteous, righteous men who walked before God in purity. Did they do it? No. Um, is it even mentioned for all of them that they had faith? previous to it saying that for example with noah no it's not actually but the way that you can know that this is true is because it has the promise of god and his seal of election upon it right and so it's the same with us we can speak of those who god has chosen and how do we know that he's chosen them because he has said so in baptism because he has said so in the absolution because he has said so by not just said so he has let them eat of his flesh and drink of his blood that were given and shed for them for the forgiveness of their sins. The word was preached to them. And um, that's really where the juice is, right? That's where the juice is. Yeah. yeah. And this, this whole exercise of trying to analyze whether a person has faith or not, and those kind of things, that is, that's not our place. It's really, uh, it's, it's really going to uh, sap our energy, the joy that we have in the faith. And it's going to drive us into this spiral of, self-analysis and, and just uh, constant introspection. And for people like myself who came out of, a, of a two traditions that used to be very focused on the internal workings and uh, this evaluation, like I told somebody uh, in church uh, last Sunday, look, you just meet God where he told you to meet him, which is in the baptismal font, bread and wine that is... Uh, given to us, administered to us every Sunday. That's where his promises are attached. 
and and that's it. You you meet him where he told you to meet him, and forgiveness is there, and you don't have to con continue to analyze and, and overthink and try to you know beat your neighbor with your works of righteousness. None of that. Just just accept the promises of Christ and, and, and live and live there. And that's that's the end of that for me. That's for me. That's the way I see it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, do we have any closing statements from Pastor Roland, or anything else to say on the matter? Well, just just uh, if I, if I may ask you guys, uh, yeah, for 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 people that may uh, watch this, just a brief definition of what theosis is, and a few sentences so I, that I can take as well back home, right? Uh, that that I may have a clear cut definition, simple definition of what theosis is. Um, and I think we all understand that um, that theosis is not a thing that of yesterday. We are still under the we're still susceptible to that. So, if you can say that, if you can define that uh, shortly and concisely for me or and for my future viewers, uh, I would really appreciate it. And then, of course, you can close. Uh, I mean, this is, a, this is your show, so if you you, you do the closing and and uh, and we call it like that. Well, I'll let Pastor Roland do this one because he's the, he's he's got the analytical philosophy brain over here. Well, uh, I'm actually going to just steal a quote from people much smarter than me to define this. Uh, basically, Stephen Finland and Vladimir Karlamov in um, in the introduction to the book Theosis Deification in Christian Theology, uh, Princeton Theological uh, Monograph. They say this, they define theosis in, in this way. They say, theosis refers to the transformation of believers into the likeness of God. Of course, Christian monotheism goes against any literal God-making of believers. Rather, the New Testament speaks of a transformation of mind, a metamorphosis of character, a redefinition of selfhood, and an imitation of God. So that, that, I think, would be the functioning, working definition of theosis that I feel comfortable to explain because these are, these are real professionals. <laughs> uh, these are people that really know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, was, would, that was excellent. Yeah, I would, I would like to add to that, not a definition of theosis, but a definition of what us Lutherans and also of the Reformed are talking about in our similar way, which is union with Christ. And um, the way that I would like to do that is I would like to simply say union with Christ is not dependent upon your works, but upon the grace of God, the initiatory act of the gracious God in becoming present with you, which namely happens in Christmas through the incarnation. Excellent. 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 All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Athanasius. And this was great having you on. And uh, I'd like everybody who's listening to please go and check out the Wittenberg Project and go and check out Dr. Athanasius's also the other YouTube channel, which the name I forget, I don't speak Spanish, but. Uh, Proyecto Wittenberg is, is, is very easy to find. Yeah, right. Yeah. That one. And um, yeah. yeah, this is this has been great. Um, yeah, and, and the listeners know where to find us, me and Roland. And uh, God bless everybody. Until next time, this has been the Blood and Bone Podcast. And uh, we, we will be pleased to have you again in the future. All right, God bless.